Have you ever wondered why the Bible is broken out into Old and New Testaments? What's a testament anyway? Well, the English word testament comes from the Latin word testamentum, which is a translation of the Hebrew word berit. And berit means covenant. In other words, the terms Old Testament and New Testament actually mean Old Covenant and New Covenant. And broadly speaking, these are the two main movements or acts in the overarching story of God. And it really is a story with a beginning and a middle and an end. And today, we're going to study Jeremiah's Old Covenant prophecy announcing God's promise of a New Covenant. We're going to answer the question, how does the New Covenant differ from the Old Covenant? What exactly makes it new? And we'll look at its historical and prophetic context and the essence of what it is and its fulfillment as prophecy. And we'll also look at who the new covenant was made with and what it means that God will write his law or his Torah on their hearts. And in our discussion, we'll be drawing a bit from the book Sealed with an Oath by Paul Williamson. We'll also bring in comments from several other scholars. And I think you're going to find this a fascinating discussion. We take it for granted today, but in the ancient Near East, the transcendent teleological view of reality that was held by the ancient Israelites, in which there's an ultimate purpose behind reality, and history is thought of as a timeline that's actually heading somewhere, a story that's unfolding and is being directed by a single creator God. Well, that worldview was shockingly unique in the ancient Near East. For the rest of the ancient world, time was thought of as a wheel, an endless spinning repetition of events with no real meaning that, that wasn't headed anywhere. This worldview set apart the Israelite religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from all the polytheistic pagan belief systems around them. In fact, in the pagan cyclical view of reality, where history is an ever repeating wheel, the very concept of moving from an old to a new covenant wouldn't even make sense. So let's talk about that progression. As you know, the old covenant was an agreement or a contract that the living God, Yahweh, entered into with the nation of Israel. We read about this covenant in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It was first introduced just after God rescued the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and he brought them to Mount Sinai, and he told them, in Exodus 19, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So, if Israel obeyed God and kept his covenant, he would bless them. But obey what exactly? Well, God gave Israel a set of commands that the Bible calls the law of Moses, because Moses was the mediator that God used to give his laws to Israel. And the law of Moses served as the terms of this Sinai covenant. In Deuteronomy 11, Yahweh tells Israel, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today. So if Israel obeyed the law, they would keep the covenant and reap blessings. If they disobeyed it, they would break the covenant and be cursed. And as the Bible records, even though God gave the Israelites countless chances, they were not able to keep the law and ultimately broke the covenant and inherited the curses. But God, in His eternal mercy and grace, promised to make a new covenant with His people. And that new covenant is promised through the prophet Jeremiah. The passage that tells us about this new covenant is found in Jeremiah 31. Let's read it, starting at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So 
God was faithful to the Old Covenant, but Israel wasn't. Verse 33, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Such a beautiful passage. And this is the only explicit mention of God's promise of the new covenant in the Old Testament. However, that doesn't mean God's new covenant isn't a major theme in the Old Testament, because it is. While the specific language is only found in Jeremiah 31, the concept is spoken of in many other places, including Hosea 2 and Jeremiah chapters 32 and 33 and 50, and Ezekiel chapters 11 and 16 and and 34 and 36 and 37, and Isaiah chapters 40 through 66 speak of it. In fact, I would argue that this new covenant is the one that all the other covenants anticipate and foreshadow, not just the Sinai covenant, but God's covenants with Abraham and David as well. They all point to Jesus and the new covenant. Paul Williamson writes this, Old Testament expectations of a future everlasting covenant find their ultimate fulfillment in the Christian gospel. Such a reading does not necessarily deny that the reconstitution of the Israelite community is the primary focus of such Old Testament oracles. Rather, taking its cue from Jesus, it redefines the Israel that is, const- that is reconstituted. While certainly including biological descendants of Abraham, this new covenant community is not defined by biological ancestry, but rather by spiritual descent. And we've discussed the the New Testament definition of Israel and God's people in detail in another episode, which I'll link to below. And we'll also touch on it a bit here. So this new covenant passage in Jeremiah 31 plays a significant role in the New Testament. In fact, the author of Hebrews cites it twice. He first quotes it in full in Hebrews 8, which, by the way, is the longest Old Testament quotation in the New Testament. And then he cites it again in Hebrews 10. He clearly believes this text in Jeremiah is crucial to our understanding of how the believer's relationship to God has changed and improved in Christ. And he wasn't alone. Jesus himself explicitly invoked the new covenant at the Last Supper. He said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the Apostle Paul teaches in in 2 Corinthians 3 that God has made us ministers of a new covenant. In fact, the concept of the new covenant is behind the contrasts that he makes between the old and the new in that chapter. And the author of Hebrews twice describes Jesus as the mediator of a new covenant. And it's further alluded to in places like Acts 10, 43 and, and Romans eleven twenty seven and elsewhere. So this Old Testament text is no doubt of great importance to Jesus and the New Testament authors. So let's spend some time examining it and we'll start with the historical context. Historically speaking, the new covenant prophecy in Jeremiah was given 600 years before Jesus. And we can't divorce it from the historical situation in which it was given. Jeremiah's new covenant prophecy was given after Israel had split into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah in the south, which consisted of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and the kingdom of Israel in the north, which contained the other 10 tribes. And these kingdoms struggled with all sorts of rebellion and idolatry, and they were ruled over by terrible kings. And God sent prophets to warn them but they wouldn't listen. So he ultimately punished the northern kingdom of Israel by allowing them to be conquered by Assyria and taken into captivity. And so Jeremiah lived in the final days of the crumbling southern kingdom of Judah. He was sent to warn them to repent so that they wouldn't be punished like the northern kingdom. And by the way, many critical scholars aren't able or willing to see beyond that immediate historical setting of the prophecy. They insist on interpreting it solely within the context of the kingdom of Judah breaking the covenant and their impending exile to Babylon. For example, F.C. Holmgren writes this, Nowhere 
In chapter 31, verses 30, 31 through 34, or in its broader context, is there any indication that this announcement of a new covenant is to have its fulfillment hundreds of years later? The oracle is not a vision into the far-flung future. The plain sense of the passage points to a covenant with Israel and Judah, that is, with the people who lived in the general time period in which Jeremiah exercised his prophetic calling. Throughout the book of Jeremiah, the prophet calls for a return to God, which means a turning back to the Sinai covenant. There's no indication that he's looking forward to a new, different kind of covenant. Any interpretation of this one passage, which speaks of a new covenant, must keep this general context in view. And this position, of course, flies in the face of how Jesus and the New Testament authors understood the new covenant. We just looked at a number of passages that show that. But I just wanted you to be aware that there's this line of thinking out there in case you come across it in your reading. For those of us who accept the authority of the New Testament, we can adopt a more nuanced reading of Jeremiah's prophecy in which there are both immediate and future events being prophesied. So that's the historical setting. But now let's look at this New Covenant passage in its context within the book of Jeremiah. So this text is found within a distinct section that's often referred to as the book of consolation or the book of hope. And it spans from chapters 30 through 33. And the overarching theme of this section is the future restoration of Israel and Judah to the Promised Land. And if you're familiar with the text of Jeremiah as a whole, you'll notice that these chapters present a more positive aspect of his prophecies. And when we read about God's calling of Jeremiah in chapter 1, we see a sort of twofold ministry. In chapter 1, verse 10, Yahweh tells Jeremiah, See, I have, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So Jeremiah, who is about 17 years old when he's called, he's called to destroy, but also to build, to overthrow, but also to plant. And for at least the first 25 chapters of this book, the prophet is focused on the former, the destroying and overthrowing that's to come. His message is that, as Gordon McConville put it, there could be no hope of salvation for Judah except through the judgment of exile. And McConville sees the turning point in the book of Jeremiah happening around chapter 25, which sort of links the two parts of the book together. Well, Williamson writes this, Thus understood, Jeremiah chapters 26 through 29, focusing on Jeremiah's role as a true prophet of Yahweh, serves not only to introduce the new positive phase of Jeremiah's prophetic ministry, but also to distinguish Jeremiah from his self-serving prophetic contemporaries whose false assurances of hope may have seemed all too similar. In any case, more positive elements appear in these chapters that are unpacked in Jeremiah chapters 30 through 33, chapters that clearly focus on the second aspect of Jeremiah's ministry, the work of reconstruction. So this book of consolation or, or book of hope begins with the pronouncement that all God's people will return from exile to the promised land. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 3 says, for behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. In the verses that follow, this restoration is further elaborated, and we're told how this time of trouble is going to come to an end, and, and a new Davidic king will be raised up, right? Verse 9 says, But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. And of course, the actual King David had died centuries earlier. This is a common way for the prophets to refer to the Messiah. They call him David because God promised that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. And Jeremiah goes on to tell us that this future restoration will include the entire people of God. Again, when this prophecy was given, the northern kingdom of Israel had been scattered, and the southern kingdom of Judah was wavering, right? And God said in verse 3, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. So Jeremiah was speaking of restoration in that sense as well, reuniting the people of God. 
And he uses Exodus imagery to, to show how Yahweh will gather his scattered people in a sort of new Exodus. Jeremiah 31.1 says, uh, oops. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. And Jeremiah speaks of them returning to their homes where they would experience God's promised rest and, and their mourning and sorrow would give way to joyousness and, and Israel's fortunes would be restored. And that brings us to the larger passage in which we find the New Covenant text, which continues Jeremiah's theme of restoration. And this larger passage is actually made up of three subsections, each of which begins with the words, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. And each of these three sections talks about how Yahweh will bless and restore in the new era. So the first section starts at verse 27, and it talks about how God will reverse the judgment that He denounced earlier in the book of Jeremiah against both humans and animals. So back in chapter 7, verse 20, Yahweh said, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, upon man and beast, upon the trees of the field and the fruit of the ground. It will burn and not be quenched. And then in chapter 21, verse 6, uh, he says, And I will strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. So... God had announced judgment on man and beast, but then here comes the good news of God reversing that judgment in Jeremiah uh, chapter 31, verse 27. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah, so the entire people of God, with the seed of man and the seed of beast. So rather than being cut down, both man and animal will be fruitful and multiply. And in the next verse, we find that same language of destroying and building that we saw back in chapter 1. God says, And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring harm, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. So God promises to be as vigilant about their restoration as he was about their punishment. So the newly planted people of God will be free from the historical or ancestral guilt of their rebellion and idolatry and wickedness. That would be dealt with through the judgment of the exile. And then the second subsection starts at verse 31 with the new covenant language we read earlier, and it continues all the way down to verse 37. In light of the exile, Jeremiah talks about how Yahweh will ultimately ensure the preservation of his people in the future. As we read earlier, he'll make a new covenant with them that will not be like the Sinai covenant. And we'll get into the many differences in a moment. But one thing I don't want us to miss at this point is the unbreakable nature of this new covenant. God promises that the future of his people will be absolutely secure. As we so often see in the prophets, Jeremiah communicates this truth symbolically and poetically using cosmic imagery. It almost reads like a hymn. So immediately after the New Covenant passage that we just read earlier, we read this, starting at verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. So Jeremiah invokes the grand scope of the fixed order of creation to show how Yahweh's sovereignty over all things ensures that His promised salvation will come to pass. He's using a creative literary approach to declare that heaven and earth would sooner pass away than God's promise of a new covenant not be fulfilled. This is the same thing Jesus taught during His Sermon on the Mount when He said, Until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, Pat will pass from the law and the prophets until all is accomplished. 
right? Heaven and earth would sooner pass away than Jesus not accomplish His mission. And then the third subsection is found in verses 38 through 40. And here, God's speaking about expanding the boundaries of the city of Jerusalem. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. And the measuring line shall go out farther, straight to the hill Garib, and shall then turn to Goa. The whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be sacred to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or overthrown any more forever. And this passage further highlights the, the security of, his, of this future era by focusing on the rebuilding and the consecration of Jerusalem. Right? Williamson writes this, Areas that were formerly desecrated by dead bodies and sacrificial ashes would in the future be sacred to Yahweh, thus indicating that no area would be defiled as a consequence of sin in the rebuilt city. Hence, the city will never again be uprooted or demolished. Not only will God's city be rebuilt, it will never again be uprooted or demolished. And that phrase at the end of verse 40 throws a bit of a monkey wrench into the works for those who maintain that this prophecy applies only to the immediate exile and return of Israel and Judah in the 6th century BC. Because the city that Jeremiah speaks of, uh, quote, shall not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. Or the NIV says it this way, it will never again be uprooted or demolished. Yet, the actual city of Jerusalem was uprooted and demolished and overthrown in the first century. It wasn't just the temple that was destroyed, the entire city was destroyed, and it was ultimately renamed to Aelia Capitolina by the Romans, and Jews were prohibited from entering it for the next 500 years. It wasn't renamed back to Jerusalem until the fourth century when Constantine changed it. So the unbreakable city that Jeremiah has prophesying about couldn't ultimately be the physical city of Jerusalem, which would be overthrown. Jeremiah is speaking of what the New Testament calls the New Jerusalem, which will never be uprooted or destroyed. In its immediate context, Jeremiah's New Covenant prophecy certainly offered a glowing promise of hope for the Israelites. It showed that God would maintain His relationship with His people in the future. And as Williamson put it, quote, this clearly gives Jeremiah's New Covenant oracle a climactic significance, close quote. It pointed God's people forward to a glorious future promise, a promise, by the way, that was not fulfilled by the end of the Old Testament. In fact, the Old Testament ends as a bit of a cliffhanger. Neither the promised Messiah nor the promised New Covenant had yet arrived. So Jeremiah unmistakably reveals that the new covenant, the new relationship between Yahweh and his people, would be profoundly different from the Sinai covenant. And this discontinuity is highlighted by the adjective he uses to describe it, right? He calls it new, which in Hebrew is chadash. And by the way, we did another episode on why this passage in Jeremiah doesn't speak of a renewed covenant, and I'll link to that below. So, Jeremiah not only calls it a new covenant, in Hebrew it's berit chadashah, but he also specifically says that it's not like the covenant God made with Israel at Sinai. He says Israel broke that covenant, and by contrast he says, this is the covenant that I will make with my people after those days. And he goes on to describe it. So there's a clear contrast being made. He's speaking of a new covenant. But what's interesting, is the incredible continuity that this new covenant shares with the old, right? It's addressed to the same people as the old covenant, namely all the tribes of Israel. It also involves the same standard of obedience to God's Torah or his instruction. It also establishes the same relationship. I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is the same covenant formula we see back in Exodus 19 at Sinai. So how does this new covenant differ from the old one? What exactly is new about the New Covenant? Well, there are at least five significant differences described in this passage in Jeremiah. Let's look at them. First, 
While the Israelites were given very strong conditions for keeping the Old Covenant, there's not even a hint of mutual obligation here. Williamson writes this, Some interpreters have rightly noticed the emphasis in the text on the divine initiative. This covenant's unilateral nature is highlighted by the dominant use of the first person throughout these verses. I will make, I will put, I will write, I will be, I will forgive, I will remember. So, as opposed to a conditional or bilateral covenant in which both parties have an obligation, which is what the old covenant was, the new covenant is what's called a unilateral or one-sided or unconditional covenant. This is the same type of covenant that God entered into with Abraham. Abraham wasn't required to do anything to keep up his end of the deal. God put no conditions on that covenant. And likewise, there's no if clause with the new covenant. Right? We saw at Sinai how Yahweh told Israel, He said, If you obey my commandments and keep the covenant, you will be blessed. If you disobey my law and break the covenant, you will be cursed. And there's none of that conditional language here. God's new covenant won't be dependent on the obedience or works of God's people. Instead, it will be founded on the perfect and completed work of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that the people of God have no obligations under the new covenant, not at all. That's clearly implied in this passage when God says in verse 33 that I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. So under the new covenant, the people of God are still expected to obey God and and to live as God's set-apart people. And that brings us to a second major difference in the new covenant. The language here makes it abundantly clear that Yahweh Himself will facilitate obedience. God will put His law, His Torah, the expression of His will, within His people. He's going to write His word on their hearts rather than tablets of stone. Walter Brueggemann puts it this way, The commandments will not be an external rule which involves hostility, but will now be an embraced internal identity-giving mark, so that obeying will be as normal and as readily accepted as breathing and eating. The Apostle Paul described it this way in uh, Romans 7, We serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Williamson writes this, So a major difference between the Old Covenant and the New is that the obligations of the Covenant will be internalized in the New Covenant community. Consequently, the primary objective of the earlier Covenant, a permanent divine human relationship, would now be attainable. Because as we've seen, Israel was not able to keep the Old Covenant. And that brings us to the third difference in the New Covenant. Because God would write His Law or Torah inside His people, it would affect the entire covenant community, not just a few righteous people, as we saw with Israel in the righteous remnant under the old covenant. Here's Williamson again. Internalization of the law was not a radically new concept, nor was the associated idea of circumcision of the heart. But such had certainly not been the collective experience of the covenant community. Rather, such had been the distinguishing mark of individuals in the community, who constituted Israel's righteous remnant. So prior to this new covenant passage in in Jeremiah 31, the prophet had emphasized that God's people as a whole were locked up under sin. In chapter 6, verse 10, Jeremiah writes, Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. And by contrast, under the new covenant, God's law would be internalized by everyone who belongs to the covenant community. And this is why Jeremiah writes in chapter 31, verse 34, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. It was a lack of knowledge of God and His law that led to divine judgment for Israel, first for the northern kingdom, and then, as Jeremiah has been warning, for Judah. But the prophet says that things will be very different in the New Covenant era. The entire New Covenant community will know Yahweh. And this word know, as in know the Lord, in Hebrew, it's yadah. 
And in Hebrew categories, the idea of yada, knowing, is much more than just theoretical knowledge or, or being aware of facts. It, it's a very intimate experiential term. Genesis 4.1 says, Adam knew yada, Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. So this new covenant idea that they, that they shall all know God is talking about an inward, experiential, personal relationship with Him. It's the natural response of everyone who's come to faith in Jesus and been born again. Our minds have been renewed and our hearts have been, as Williamson puts it, inscribed with Yahweh's Torah, with God's instructions and His will. And under the new covenant, we're led by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.6 says, God has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The old covenant was a letter, a covenant of the letter, of tablets of stone, of, of the written code. The new covenant is the covenant of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.4 says that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us who walk according to the Spirit. And that's one of the most distinctive features of the new covenant. And it's why under the new covenant, knowledge of God and a desire to obey Him is reflected across the entire body of believers, not just a righteous remnant, for they shall all know me from the least of these to the greatest. Now, this obviously doesn't mean that everyone is instantly turned into a perfect saint, but it does mean that when we come to faith in Jesus, the knowledge of God is written in our hearts. Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, in those who are in Christ. And 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. And that brings us to the fourth and most glorious difference between the Old and the New Covenants. This New Covenant passage ends in verse 34 with God's statement, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, in this prophecy, Jeremiah doesn't explain on what basis God will forgive the sins of his people. He just tells us that's what God's going to do. And going back to the idea we discussed earlier, this is a unilateral, unconditional covenant in which God makes a series of I statements, right? I will make, I will put, I will write. Well, he also says, I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. God's promised new covenant will be carried by the grace of Yahweh Himself. And as the New Testament will later reveal, God will even provide the necessary sacrifice Himself. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus is the basis on which God will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And the Hebrew word zakar is translated as remember. And it means more than just merely the mental recall of a fact or, or an event. It's not that God will no longer have a recollection of our sin, but that He will no longer hold it against us. This phrase uses a bit of Hebrew parallelism, where the same idea is said twice in slightly different ways for emphasis. So, forgive their iniquity means the same thing as remember their sin no more. Jeremiah is speaking of an eternal forgiveness. And of course, this is the forgiveness we receive when we place our faith in Jesus. In fact, the author of Hebrews will later quote this passage in Jeremiah to make that exact point. Let's take a look. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Under the new covenant, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Why? Well, a few verses earlier in verse 10, the author of Hebrews wrote, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus is how God has forgiven our iniquity, and He's why He remembers our sins no more under the new covenant. This is a mind-blowing truth. We serve a God of infinite grace and mercy. And this idea of eternal forgiveness introduce a, introduces a paradigm shift for the Israelites, 
and for the first century Jewish believers in Jesus and for our Hebrew roots friends today. By saying that sin would no longer be remembered, Jeremiah prophesied the end of the sacrificial system given under the Old Covenant. This means that the law God would write on the hearts of His people in the New Covenant era would not be identical to the law He gave with the Old Covenant. And we'll get more into that in a bit. And here's the fifth way that the New Covenant differs from the Old one. Because the New Covenant is unilateral and carried entirely by Yahweh, and because He promises eternal forgiveness, there's no possibility of breaking this New Covenant. Andrew Dearman puts it this way, speaking of the covenantal relationship between God and His people. The ability of sin to disrupt the relationship is made obsolete by the astounding announcement that God will not remember sins and their effects on the relationship. As we looked at earlier, Jeremiah goes on to use cosmic imagery to show God's new covenant was assured and eternal. Think about what this would have meant to the Israelites, who, who struggled for literally centuries, and their sin resulted in, in the breaking of the old covenant and their exile and punishment by God. But unlike the old covenant, the new covenant is unbreakable. Williamson writes this, Sin cannot imperil the divine human relationship guaranteed by this new covenant, for sin will not be brought into account. God will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This means that the very essence and nature of the bond between God and His covenant people has radically changed under the new covenant. So, let's take a look at who those new covenant people are. In the New Covenant passage, Jeremiah explicitly tells us with whom God will make His new covenant. Verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So the language that Jeremiah uses has led some internet theologians to conclude that the new covenant must not be for Gentiles and that it's only for Israelites. And of course, that interpretation flies in the face of not just what the New Testament teaches, but also what the Old Testament prophesied. Let's break it down. So put yourselves in the sandals of the prophet Jeremiah in, in the sixth century BC, right? What was he trying to communicate with the phrase, the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Well, we talked about how this prophecy was given after the kingdom had split and the ten tribes of Israel in the north had been captured and exiled, and the kingdom of Judah in the south was about to fall. And in the midst of this chaos and disunity, God speaks an incredible word of future restoration and hope through the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 30, verse 3, he said, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. And here in chapter 31, he promises that his new covenant will be made with the houses of Israel and Judah. So by including both Israel and Judah in his prophecy, Jeremiah is communicating that Yahweh's future restoration and his new covenant will include the entire people of God. It won't be a fractured kingdom. And Jeremiah was certainly aware that going all the way back to Abraham, God had been promising to bless the entire world not just the, the nation of Israel. He promised Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And the Old Testament often speaks of God blessing the nations. But Jeremiah wasn't privy to exactly how or when that would happen. He knew God had promised a Messiah, but he didn't know it would be a man named Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. And he didn't know that it was through faith in Jesus that the Gentiles would be grafted in. Quick sidebar here. When we're reading any of the prophets, it's important to remember that the language and imagery that they use is necessarily constrained to the imagery and language that they had available to them in their time. Not only because that's the only language and imagery that the prophet knew, but also because it's the only language and imagery that his readers would understand. For example, in Isaiah 66, when the prophet wants to communicate that in the new heaven and new earth, People from every nation will make their way up to Jerusalem by all possible means of travel. His language is necessarily limited to the nations he knows about and the means of travel that were available in his day. 
So he talks about places like Tarshish and Tubal and Javar. For Isaiah and his readers, these locations symbolized the far reaches of the known world at the time. He certainly couldn't have listed Canada and Luxembourg and China, not only because Isaiah knew nothing of those nations, but also because his readers would have had no idea what he was talking about. And this is also why he mentions people going up to Jerusalem on horses and mules and camels and, and in chariots. If he would have said that in the end times, people will go up to Jerusalem on planes, trains, and automobiles, his readers would have no idea what he's talking about. So Isaiah uses the language and imagery of his time to give a prophecy to the people of his time. Likewise, when Jeremiah wants to speak of the entirety of God's people, he uses language that will communicate that to his readers. And at that time, the way to refer to the entirety of God's people was the phrase, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And when we get to the New Testament and the revelation of Jesus, we learn that the definition of God's people has been expanded. It no, it's no longer based on physical ancestry, but rather spiritual lineage. The New Testament is full of language that refers to believers as adopted into the family of God and, and as His children. Galatians 3, 7 says, It is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Romans 1, 16 says that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. In Romans 3.29, is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Romans 10.12 says, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. Right? And Jesus Himself, after His resurrection, commanded us to what? Go and make disciples of all nations. Right. So the New Testament terminology for referring to the entire people of God is the body of Christ or the kingdom of God. And it includes everyone who's placed their faith in Jesus, whether they're from the house of Israel or the house of Judah or the Gentile nations. And by the way, conversely, being from the house of Israel or Judah no longer means that you're automatically part of God's covenant people. The requirement under the new covenant is faith in Jesus. In other words, God said He would make His new covenant with the entire people of God. And because of Jesus, the definition of the people of God changed. In the new covenant passage, Jeremiah explicitly tells us that God will put His law inside His people. Verse 33, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." The language Jeremiah uses here has led many of our Hebrew Roots friends to conclude that the New Covenant must include the exact same law as the Old Covenant, but now it's just on the inside instead of on the outside. After all, this is an Old Testament passage, so what other law could Yahweh possibly be, re be referring to than the Old Covenant law, right? In fact, the Hebrew word translated as law in this verse is Torah which can refer to that law. And therefore, our Hebrew roots friends will argue, Christians are required to eat kosher and keep the Torah feasts and be circumcised and keep the seventh day Sabbath and so on. But of course, we don't even need to leave this passage in Jeremiah to see the flaw in that logic. We mentioned earlier that because Yahweh said that under the new covenant, he will remember their sin no more, Jeremiah was prophesying the end of the Old Covenant sacrificial system, and that system is required under the Old Covenant law. Hebrews 10.3 says the Old Covenant sacrifices were an annual reminder of sins, but Jeremiah 31.34 says that under the New Covenant, Yahweh will remember their sin no more. Hebrews 10.10 says we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And therefore, Hebrews 10.18 says, there is no longer any offering for sin. Jesus is how God has forgiven our iniquity and why He remembers our sins no more under the new covenant. So by prophesying that sins would no longer be remembered, Jeremiah foretold the end of the old covenant sacrificial system. And again, that system is part and parcel of the law of Moses. 
This means that the law that God would write on the hearts of his people in the new covenant era would be different in at least one respect than the law he gave with the old covenant. And the one difference clearly outlined here in Jeremiah is absolutely profound. It has to do with how Yahweh deals with sin. And sin is at the heart of God's entire story of redemption. It's what led to the fall of mankind and creation, and it's why God enacted his grand story of redemption that plays out on the pages of Scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Sin is why he sent Jesus. It's why Jesus died on the cross. It's why Jesus was resurrected. If mankind had never sinned, there would have been no need for God to reconcile creation and humanity back to himself. So the fact that under the new covenant, sin would be dealt with in a radical new way, that it would be eternally forgiven, means that all the parts of the old covenant law that were given to address sin would come to an end in the fulfillment of Christ's once for all sacrifice. This is a change of staggering significance in Yahweh's law. And of course, that's just what this short passage in Jeremiah reveals. And by the way, don't miss the fact that this revelation that the requirements of God's law would change under the new covenant was foretold under the old covenant. And what Jeremiah's new covenant prophecy hints at will later be fleshed out in full color by Jesus and the New Testament writers. The New Testament says this about the rituals that were commanded under the Old Covenant, Colossians 2. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And in the New Testament, we discover that believers are now God's temple, and we no longer need the the physical temple required under the Old Covenant law. We also learn that believers in Jesus are priests who have been given priestly duties. So the Levitical priesthood required under the Old Covenant law is no longer needed either. We did an episode that goes into these ideas in much more detail, which I'll link to below. So let me sum it up this way. We saw how the definition of God's people was expanded in the New Covenant to include not just Israelites, not just physical descendants of Abraham, but anyone who's put their faith in Jesus. Galatians 3.29 says, if you are in Christ, you're considered Abraham's offspring. So we might say it this way, under the New Covenant, there is still a body or assembly called God's people, but the content of that assembly has changed because of Christ. And in the same way, under the new covenant, there's still a standard of obedience called God's Torah or law. But the content of that law has changed because of Christ. Thanks for tuning in. Shalom.